most condensed way possible. Do you believe that there are issues present in the mind of the education system? Yes. Yes, I do. I think one of the biggest problems that I see and that I read about daily are the vouchers. Oh, of course. There's many, many problems in education. There are problems. For years, there have been issues that plague public schools. Low test scores in performance, underfunding of schools, social disparities. All of these have been constants in American education that has spanned generations. Proposals and actions have been taken, but these issues have remained as common and present as ever. As a current student myself, these problems have caused me to question at times why they are present. Over the past year especially, I've become much more aware of them and question them even further as to what's causing them and why is there not enough mainstream attention. This led me to wanting to answer this on my own. I wanted to seek answers from people who were aware of these issues. Being the child of an educator, I naturally asked my dad, who has years of experience, about these issues. This only further motivated me to seek my own answers, and I thought who better to ask than the professionals at my own school district, the Nogales Unified School District, about these issues, and if there was any potential solutions to them. Could you please state your name and occupation? My name is Ralph Almanzar. I am the assistant principal at Nogales High School. I have 30 plus years of experience in the education field. My name is Christy Beach and I am one of the assistant principals here at Nogales High School. Aisa Bonillas, I am the assistant superintendent and current lead administrator here at Nogales High School. My name is Kathy Scott. I've been in education 50 years. I started in 1973 as a teacher and have been a teacher, a counselor, and a grants director. For my name is Christopher Miranda. I'm the principal for the Shadow Bank School. So firstly, I'd like you to show you this graph. This um, is just a bunch of percentages regarding the um, funding and where that funding is coming from for public schools. While many are aware that public schools are funded through government funding, it is not well known exactly the amount of where this funding comes from. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, from the years 2019 to 2020, 47.5% of funding came from state funding, 365 from poverty taxes, 1.2% in private funding, 7.1% of other public revenue, and only 7.6% of school funding coming from the federal government. So that leaves the question, is underfunding the result of not enough federal support? So with these national statistics being presented, do you believe there should be more support and funding from the federal government? Most definitely. I think the federal government needs to provide a lot more funding for public schools. I definitely believe there should be more funding from the federal government. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, because we, uh, you know, we are public servants. And so we work to provide education to our students. We're very lucky in Nogales because we do have the override and the bond that was just passed by our taxpayers. So we're very blessed that our community, you know, believes in public education. But statewide, we're 48th in funding. And so, you know, our government at, in Phoenix and our people that are, you know, making those decisions aren't looking for public educational funding. If we're $900 billion, you know, in the hole, per se, I mean, it's not the nicest way of putting it, but mm -hmm. in the red, you know, that money could go to public schools and public school students and yeah. teachers and families who, you know, receive those services. And whether we're number one or number 48, I know that we're going to do our absolute best to, you know, teach and have students learn to the best of our ability. It doesn't matter what, how much, you know, the government is funding us but obviously we would like to be much higher mm -hmm. than 48th in education mm -hmm. so the irony is that we're 48th in education but we're also very low in public funding so mm -hmm. those two go together yes 
I believe there should be more funding from the federal level mm -hmm. that goes to the states and from the state level down to the districts. Yeah. I don't think the federal government should fund school districts without going through the state first mm -hmm. because there's no way that the federal government could have equity. Only the state would know that perhaps Nogales needs more money than Catalina Foothills Correct. per student not money overall, yeah. but the students in Nogales, Eloy, Douglas, Yuma, mm -hmm. they have unique challenges. And so it would be more beneficial to students to have the state be what's called a pass-through mm -hmm. because they would have more direct knowledge. I see. So it has to be like a collaborative effort between all parties, correct? It, it has to be a collaborative effort, yeah. but the federal government would decide equitably mm -hmm. how much each state would receive. The state would then decide how much each district would receive. And then we, in my capacity, decide how much each school within that district receives. Mm -hmm. For example, based on their number of students in poverty, Lincoln receives far more money than Coronado because the students that go to Lincoln have a higher poverty rate mm -hmm. than the students that go to Coronado. I feel that I think that more federal, federal funding can definitely help and assist in many areas. Why? Because each state has a specific uh, budget allocated to public ed. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Arizona, uh, we, we have a certain amount that it's ranked us, if I'm not mistaken, around 48th or 49th in the country on public education funds. So definitely anything in addition can definitely be more beneficial for all public ed. So another related topic um, for finance and for public schools I'd like to introduce is Yazi Martinez versus the state of New Mexico. Are you familiar with that court case? Um, I'm very familiar with that court case. The majority of my professional career, career was in New Mexico, so I know about Yazi Martinez. In 2018, it was ruled that the state of New Mexico failed to provide sufficient services and funding to at-risk students, English learners, bilingual students, and various other groups of students. New Mexico failed to provide a, an education that was up to constitutional standards for its districts and students. This case proved that students were not being provided enough funding in a state. However, this is not the only isolated case of this happening. Through my research of this topic, I found endless evidence and data on underfunding. I wanted to ask the educational professionals of my district to better understand if issues similar to this case were occurring in Arizona. Now, with states often being fitting the majority of the bill of, for education, oftentimes there are many schools and districts that fall through the cracks and are not supported enough. And, of course, you just read the very recent um, case of that was Yazi Martinez versus the state of New Mexico. And with the background information received and based off of personal experience, do you believe that this is a problem present in Arizona and the country as a whole? I do. Um, again, uh, I'm from New Mexico, born and raised, educated in New Mexico. I've worked in different parts of the state, uh, whereas I worked in Las Cruces, one of the bigger districts in the state was a superintendent in the second smallest district in the state and also worked in the southwest corner of uh, New Mexico in Lordsburg. So um, to some degree, Arizona is very similar to New Mexico as far as the ge geography of the state. Uh, you have the, the big school districts in Phoenix and in Tucson and then smaller districts say in maybe Nogales, uh, you know, up, uh, on the uh, Navajo Reservation, there are quite a few, and then just uh, smaller rural districts, for example, like Safford, uh, Ganado, um, Chinle. I've been in all those places, and so the topography, the way it's put up, is very similar to New Mexico. Um, it's been my experience that um, there are at-risk students at every level, uh, whether it be in the city or out, out in the rural areas of the state. So. Most definitely, I think uh, Arizona and New Mexico are similar in a lot of ways, yet 
totally different than the way they are funded and the way the programs are run. It is. I believe it's a problem throughout the United States. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You can see it in the test scores. The schools that have better mm -hmm. funding have better test scores. Sure. The schools that don't, you know, we're very lucky because Nogales is very competitive. We have the best um, graduation rate in the state of Arizona. Uh, but again, I feel like the monies that we have, because we have very conscientious leaders at the district level making those decisions. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a problem in Arizona. We are one of the very lowest ranked states for receiving educational money. Okay, Not only from the federal government to Arizona, but then what Arizona decides to spend out of its budget on education. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we do have, as do surprisingly all states now, a very large percentage of what we call students in need. And it's not just Hispanics. Mm -hmm. I would like to argue the point that a state that has many Hispanics has a greater need than a state that doesn't because we have very many successful Hispanic leaders. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's not that, well, they're Hispanic, therefore they're poor, therefore right. they need more help because some of the greatest leaders and teachers in the state mm -hmm. are Hispanic. What it is is not the ethnicity. Mm -hmm. It's the income level of the family that matters. Right. For example, I'll use Nogales. Mm -hmm. If we were to get rounded off three million in Title I, <coughs> excuse me, the schools are ranked according to their population and the students in poverty. Mm -hmm. As I said, one school may get more than another. So that's already in effect. Okay? But also the idea that throwing money is going to solve the issue is not. Right. I believe it's more than that. I believe it's the social economical conditions, mm -hmm. the very high rate, not only in Arizona, but now the nation of substance abuse, mm -hmm. the high divorce rate, uh, things that impact a child's ability to learn sure. because of the disruptions in their lives. So if you had a school with 89% poverty, why is it 89% poverty? Is it because the single mother? Is it because they don't have jobs? That the parents have no education? There's a reason mm -hmm. it's a high poverty. Yeah. And I believe some of that funding should go to the reason. There should be more mental health services, sure. more substance abuse programs yeah. and not just throw money at education right i'm not saying that teachers don't deserve more raises they mm -hmm. do yes but i'm saying if you were to give every teacher in the state of arizona five thousand more i'm not sure how much that would improve the educational achievement mm -hmm. of certain students it may improve in that it encourages people to go into teaching mm -hmm. that may not have that have higher education and more commitment, that helps. But the fact that, let's say Diego, I don't know who your teachers are at Nogales High School, but let's say one teacher makes 49,000 and one teacher makes 57. It doesn't make a difference in your achievement if the factors that are in your home life are holding you back from being the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. And the one thing in the uh, lawsuit that you showed me that I super agree in mm -hmm. is increasing pre-kinder and preschool opportunities. Yes. And again, throwing money at it isn't going to help if we don't have highly qualified preschool teachers. Mm -hmm. And very few people want that job. Yeah. It just isn't a real desirable job. Mm -hmm. So even if you made a rule that every child in Arizona gets free pre-kinder, where are the teachers coming from? Yeah. Where are they housed? It's not just money. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I explained how long I've been in education. When I graduated from high school, it was very high honors. Okay? The jobs I could have gotten at college were nursing and teaching because when I graduated in 1969, 
there were not many opportunities for women. Mm -hmm. So you had some very highly skilled, highly intelligent people, women and men, but women mostly, that went into teaching. Now, a woman has as much opportunity as a man to be a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, an mm -hmm. architect. So you're not necessarily getting the best and brightest. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that teachers aren't the best and the brightest. I'm saying those going into the field of education at the U of A, ASU, NAU, when they have so many choices, may not choose education. Mm -hmm. So what do you have? You have people who, many of these that we're serving now, have education as their second job. Mm -hmm. They worked in whatever right. for 20 years. Now they're a teacher or they're going into education because they love it. You have those people. Mm -hmm. But it's not like it was even a few decades ago where education was so highly valued that you would say to your son or daughter, go be a teacher. Mm -hmm. Very few parents say to their son or daughter, be a teacher. Mm -hmm. They say, be a doctor, be a lawyer. It's uh, in the state of Arizona, I think that it's, it's how funds are allocated by each district. Um, in this case, I think that that can make a big difference as well. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, like I said, there's never going to be a limit to say, oh, we don't need more funding. Mm -hmm. Definitely, anything that's funding is more resources, more, more funding to provide programs of intervention or assist specific subgroups within our schools, within our districts, definitely is is this something that I can perceive? No, but we definitely need more. I mean, I, I feel in my opinion that public ed should be, um, in this case, be allocated more funds. Is a lack of funds a valid excuse for denying students a sufficient education? And should state and federal governments be held more accountable to come up with the funding necessary to fulfill a student's right to a sufficient education? Absolutely. Lack of funds should never be an excuse for, to not educate a student properly. Um, I, I think that um, funding is, is necessary to, you know, bring students to certain levels. And so it's just not being done. Uh, the federal government is not taking the responsibility necessary to educate our kids. Our kids are our future. And if we do not take care of our kids as far as instruction, and how to go about teaching our kids, um, we're going to suffer. And you can see that. You can definitely see that as, as the kids grow up, go into a professional field. So uh, unfortunately, I hate to say, but a lot of that um, really has a negative effect to those uh, communities and those students that are uh, poor. I don't know how else to say it. And coming from poor areas of the state, they don't have the they don't have the success that other kids do, and, and there are a lot of different reasons and factors for that. I, I believe that money is never an excuse to say you can have something and you cannot, um, and it's our responsibility to figure out how are we going to adequately educate everyone mm -hmm. um, with what we have, and certainly it would help if we had more funding from other sources. You're spending nine hundred billion dollars on vouchers. Yeah, I feel like mm -hmm. the state of Arizona should be held responsible because it's not equitable. Not everybody's getting the same right, um, and so you know, should they be held responsible? Absolutely, you know, because we are not we are not sure of what cuts are going to be made if there's going to be cuts made with the voucher system. Um, you know, giving the, the the choice to everybody. Like I said, I'm sure some parents do really take advantage because they need the services for their children. But just like my example, you know, gymnastics and cheerleading mm -hmm. are not an academic supportive curriculum, right. um, but that's what the voucher is paying for. Mm -hmm. So from your experience, there's no real regulation or, or nothing like that where the voucher book is going to. Nah, I don't think anybody knows, to be honest, because it started out something really small and mm -hmm. then it's just expanded and more and more people are taking advantage of it. That's the way I see it. And now to be at 900 billion, it's, you know, I, I'm really, you know, or a million, I'm just concerned because mm -hmm. that money's got to be taken out of somewhere. Right. And sometimes I feel 
Or a lot of the time I feel like public education is where they take that money from. Mm -hmm. State and federal, uh, feds in this case, to work together to collaborate, yes. And there should be a, uh, a joint effort, mm -hmm. a joint vision to be able to provide adequate, and in this case, uh, funding to assist all school and districts, definitely. That should be something that should be working together. The same way we do as a district when we work elementaries, middle schools, high schools, to be able to provide and prepare our students for for career and college readiness mm -hmm. or for their future, definitely it's going to be something that should be in collaboration. This next few questions are regarding um, economic status. And based off your, um, not only your professional, but personal experience, do you believe that economic status of students and their families can have big impacts on education? I, I've seen it, I've experienced it. It definitely has a, a huge impact on a student's education. I absolutely do believe it. I feel it can, uh, not at any fault of the student, but I, I feel that it can, you know, they might not, they might not be getting something outside of the school. Um, at school, we try to keep everybody, you know, we make a really strong attempt that everybody receives the same curriculum, the same style of education with highly qualified, you know, appropriately certified teachers, but we don't know what they run into at home. Mm -hmm. And so although we make, you know, we do our best to give everybody the best curriculum, the best education that we can. We don't know what they need at home. And although we do try to support that, you know, at the same time, a lot of families don't always share it with us. It has an impact, definitely. Can it be a, a whole impact? In my opinion, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the reasons is, uh, I understand sometimes in, in families who, in this case, both parents have to be working or in this case, there's only uh, one parent at the home where they also need to be working. So probably can be, it does not much time invested from the parent to the kids regarding to their academics can be. Uh, but again, it's something that is not a full factor because whoever is determined is the student to know that, and that's something we promote here a lot, mm -hmm. which is in this case, they need to be academic successful yeah. because uh, we have unprivileged students, and yet we have students with their own privilege, and they still have uh, straight students. Mm -hmm. And we also have students in this case, who in this case are in a better position uh, with the families and them, and yet, I mean, they still struggle academically. So will that be something to relate? It can be a factor, but not completely. And going off of that, I would, I'd like to present you some data from the Arizona Department of Education. And firstly, I'd like to focus in on the section that reads income eligibility one and two. And those are the students in the lowest income levels that make up Title I schools and that qualify schools as Title I. And I'd like you just to review that and the pro proficiency in not only the math scores, but on the other side, we have English as well. Um, they're very similar. And with this data and your professional opinion, what do you gather from this? Do you believe that this would count as an education crisis? Uh, uh, absolutely, it's an education crisis. Um, for me, I grew up that way. Uh, large family, parents did the best they possibly could. They did understand the importance uh, of a good education. So as I went through, you definitely see that. Um, and I think, you know, just based on the data alone, we are at a crisis level. Once, you know, not only here in Arizona, New Mexico, the Southwest, but throughout our country, inner city schools and pockets throughout the United States that where kids are suffering and they're not, uh, they don't have the advantages other kids have. And so they're not getting a quality education. And so they have to settle for less. With that being said, they also settle for less in life because they're not able to get into the, um, good schools to get a college education. They have to settle. Uh, some of them are, are not even pushed to go to school and they feel like they can't do the work. And so their, their failures, they settle for less, lesser jobs, yet um, some of them do very well as a result. It just depends on not only the education to put it, but really it depends on how you see yourself and if you're willing to work to do a good job in whatever you do. You know, 
there's so many things that go along into data. Mm -hmm. um, certainly it would show that yes, there is a big problem, um, but there are so many other things because there's plenty of people from low-income homes who have the support at home, the parents who are saying, you know, when you go to school, you're there to learn. You need to, this is how you're going to get out of this situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, of course, you have the reverse. The parents who, who are working too much, they are not able to be there. Mm -hmm. And certainly it contributes to what happens here at school. Do I see it as like, you know, what, what did you use a crisis? Yes. Um, not so much as a crisis, but it is a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, right now I think um, that we're trying to really pay attention because we do get Title I funding for our schools. As you know, um, there's all 10 of our schools are Title I, um, but we are not seeing the acad academic achievement that we would like. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that, you know, whether we're federally funded or not, it's still an achievement that we got to make. You know, and so we can look at it two ways. We can say, oh, my God, it's a crisis. What are we going to do? But at the same time, you know, is it a crisis? Well, you know, it depends what people define a crisis at. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we just need to do something. We can't worry about the ifs and whens. It's just what are we going to do and how are we going to get our students to be, um, you know, academically achieving? Okay. No. No. I don't, I don't think it is. Like I said, um, uh, income eligibility one and two and I will use an example this school mm -hmm. my school it's um, I took over five years ago when I took over the school again we were a uh, letter C and uh, we are uh, either the score with the poverty level lower than other schools if not the lowest within our district and again I mean at that point we still have we were a C mm -hmm. right now fortunately with hard work dedication we are an A school and that's again and I'm talking about from the five years since I took over as a principal mm -hmm. and that is reflected there that in this case we have the the groups that you mentioned the one and two we have them, and it's the lowest. And again, it can vary. Right. At one point, we were we were low, mm -hmm. and again, when we went to right now, we're we're a high score school. Some issues in education, and on that same graph um, that has the test score proficiencies, you can notice there's a large amount of minority groups on there: Hispanic, African American, Native American, migrant students, English learners, um, those that are homeless. And with that information, do you believe that there's a direct correlation between the economic status of students and their background? And with working in a Title I district with a large Hispanic population of students, what issues have you noticed that you would like to be fixed? Well, uh, most definitely, it, there's a lot of gaps there for those students. Uh, I can speak a lot to Hispanics. Uh, and part of it, what I see is, uh, Everything's taught in English, so Hispanic students have to learn English in order to be successful. And that being said, so the Native American students, um, not as familiar with the population in Arizona, but in New Mexico, you know, there's a, the Navajo Nation, there are two or three different Apache tribes, 19 different pueblos, they all speak different languages, and it's somewhat similar here in different parts of Arizona. So. Uh, the testing piece, everything that's taught is taught in English, and we don't spend enough time um, with the, the bilingual education. Uh, here in Nogales, it's pretty, pretty, pretty evident that we do that quite a bit, and there is a focus here in Nogales, yet uh, a lot of kids really struggle with the English, and uh, they struggle with the Azela testing and being able to pass that. Um, Let's face it, uh, socially, so the social as aspects are important. A lot of kids um, come to school and they struggle because they don't have the advantages of uh, other kids. They're um, disadvantaged economically, socially as well, and so they struggle. Um, oftentimes, in my opinion, they're looked down upon because they talk with an accent and they, um, 
may not understand some of the things that other kids take uh, for granted. For example, um, I'll give you a good example on the Nav Navajo Reservation. There are kids, both in Arizona and New Mexico, they live out in the middle of nowhere and they live in a hoga. Uh, it doesn't have running water, it doesn't have electricity. How can that be equal to someone who lives, say, in Tucson and uh, are middle to upper class that have every advantage? How do you compare that? And how do you, how do you, um, how do we get by, by testing kids in English in the same way? Yet there's so many uh, educational gaps that uh, uh, those kids suffer, most definitely when they suffer. Um, and that carries on into college. If you're able to go to college, there are a lot of things that um, you have to struggle with. I know that, I lived that, I've lived that all my life. Uh, the position I, I've received, I, I got here because I worked at it. Uh, nothing was given to me. Um, I spoke Spanish first and then learned English. Um, born in Las Cruces, New Mexico, I'm an American citizen. Yet in our family, we learned Spanish first. So when we went to school, we, learned, we knew very little English. Yet we were expected to perform just like everyone else. If you gain standardized tests in the language that, that those uh, students know, they would do very well. If you gave the standardized tests in Spanish to our kids here, they would do well, much better than they do in English. So we're at a disadvantage. And we haven't figured out how to bring these kids along as well as we should. Uh, if you don't speak a, another language, then you don't understand. You just have no clue how hard it is to learn that. I'll give you another example. I have someone very special to me that came from Mexico at age 14. He graduated from high school four years later. Uh, and started here with uh, not knowing any English and yet develop that aptitude to learn the language. Yes, she speaks with an accent, but has done very well for herself. And all that was is, was a desire to learn. It, it, it eran las ganas that she had learned to be successful because she knew that she, if she didn't learn English, there would be no success, that she would struggle. And uh, that person is my wife. And so I know that it happens. I know that it's possible, yet, uh, our students really suffer, those disadvantaged kids, the Native American kids, uh, those, you know, our kids are ELO kids, uh, the, the homeless kids, the kids are in foster care, migrants, they really suffer because they don't have the advantages that other kids do. And by that, economically, socially, it's just not there. And, and they struggle with the language. And we haven't figured out how to present our instruction where they can be successful um, consistently. I do know this, that we have some wonderful teachers within this district and I've had a lot of good teachers that I've been uh, with uh, and have been have supervised and worked with and they make the difference in the classroom. It's the teacher that makes the difference. And so we don't pay teachers enough to do that. Um, you know. Uh, our, our, our profession is even looked down on, you know, uh, our teachers work very hard, they plan, they prepare, and they go through a lot, especially since the pandemic, it's totally changed, yet yeah, uh, they don't get the, the respect that they deserve for all the hmm. So, hmm, there's so many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's so many, and, and they all sometimes circle back to the attitudes that the kids come to school with, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and and sometimes there are things we just can't change because people are struggling to survive sometimes. And if we, we're we honest, their education's not the worry. It's, am I gonna eat tonight? Mm -hmm. Where am I gonna sleep? Um, so, you know, all of those things affect scores. They affect how the students come to school. They affect how when they go back home, what's happening there. Um, but, you know, it just, we, we all have to work together to get each other 
out of the situation we're in. You know, mm -hmm. students need to take their education seriously um, and realize that it is a privilege because in a lot of other places, you wouldn't get the opportunity that we get here. And sometimes they're, they're not appreciated and they're free. So if they're free, that means money's taken out of the equation, mm -hmm. you know, but, but then it also goes back to, you know, can they focus while they're here? Do they have their needs met at home so that they can focus and, and learn and grow and be successful while they're here? Well, we've been very lucky to receive ESSER funds. And so one thing that the current administration um, has worked towards is giving every student the same opportunity, whether it be with extracurricular activity or going through textbook adoption cycles, meaning that the same book that a kindergartner at one school will be using the same curriculum in the same book at the other. Mm -hmm. And so we're really striving. Um, it's obvious that, you know, when students have, you know, if they're a minority or they don't speak English, they lose a little bit, you know, but it's our job to get them to that. Um, and how we do that, you know, whether it's a financial reason or not, our goal as teachers and as a district is just to make sure that they are academically achieving mm -hmm. and we do what we can with the money that we have. It's, uh, we are, like you, like you mentioned, and yes, we are over 90, 93, 95% of our student population is Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, other, the other remaining percentage, uh, it's basically broken down in, 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 other, in other background families. And, but however, it's, we're in a border town, which in this case, many of our students are bilingual or just Spanish speakers, and it's a responsibility. I mean, I'm a, I'm a bilingual. I'm my primary language is Spanish as well, and it's something that I mean. That's why we have our, our programs to enforce and to provide to our students that are going to be learning the language. It's the numbers are increasing every year, for not only just for my school but for all the schools within our district. So it is. It is something that I mean. Yes, it's getting too much, but again, it's. We're, that's why we have other additional sources of funding, like Title One. Yeah. Title One can can provide uh, tremendous support to assist and be able to provide that type of interventions to our students, who in this case are in disadvantage. Even I mean, they fall into those are the EL students learning the language. Uh, there are also students in this case, uh, the homeless students as well, mm -hmm. that we they get benefited from from different interventions programs and also to be able to assist them to be able to reach their academic goals in school. Yeah. Come back on a topic you somewhat touched on um, regarding the passion and the want to better yourself in education and to learn more. Um, I got a question for you. Do you believe at times that certain mindsets that originate from a student's home and community can affect the perception of the value of education? And what has been your approach to encourage positive outlook on education on the students, their families, and the overall community to value the importance of education and bettering yourself? For me as a Hispanic, um, most definitely, I have to be the role model for kids. Um, came from a, a very large family. Uh, both of my parents were, they provided the best they could for us, but we by no means were we rich. So we had to work for everything that we had. And, and the positive thing within my culture with my parents especially was that they understood the value of kids, of the good education for their kids. And so they pushed us to do that. And for me, that was the difference. Uh, as I said, I've got some wonderful t uh, teachers, not only in the school, but I've been associated with those teachers. And so they recognized how hard uh, those disadvantaged kids have to work in order to uh, stay on track with other kids. And so my experience has been the hard work does pay off. Uh, I've seen it, and, and with that being said, it is possible for kids to be successful, no matter where they come from. But I also want them to remember where they did come from. For me, I just outworked everybody. Uh, I'm no smarter than a lot of the people that I work with, but nobody's going to outwork me. And I think that was my advantage. And that's what I try to portray to, for my kids. And I tell them, look, it's not going to be easy, but you need to work a little bit harder, you need to take pride in what you do and never forget where you came from. Have that pride and, and show everyone that you can do the work. Uh, you don't need to worry about what other people think about. All you need to worry about is yourself and what you're, what you're capable of doing. And so never giving up, working hard, 
uh, and building that desire for learning. And I talk about that a lot with my staff and my teachers. Is there a desire for learning within the classroom? And when I say that, I don't just mean the kids, but do staff members have that desire to learn and better themselves? We can always learn, we can always get better, myself included. And so continuous learning is uh, most definitely part of it. And just believe in your kids, you know. Uh, you have to believe in your kids that they can be successful. And again, you have to portray that. Uh, stay positive. Uh, and look for kids doing positive things. We don't need to focus on all the negative things that happen in the school, but look for those kids, even if they struggle, look for the positives in them, and then try to support them in that respect. So going back on that, it's what you're saying is it's a two-way street between families and educators. Well, families, they need to value education, and essentially what she says, it starts at home. Um, but as well, educators and teachers, they need to value what their role is in society. It's a major one, um, educating children and who are the future. So is that your belief that it goes both ways? Definitely. Uh, our kids are our future. And, uh, you know, we work with families that, uh, in my opinion, uh, most parents want the best for their kids. Yet, um, they uh, struggle because maybe they have a large family or they just don't have the resources to provide everything for kids. And that's where we as educators come in. So it is a partnership between families and educators. And so where, where it's lacking at home, we have to step in because when kids come to school, we are the parents. We are the, we are the people that are the role models for them. They stay with us all day long, so they might spend more time with us as educators than at home with their parents because mom and dad are probably both working. Maybe dad has two jobs and isn't always there to support kids. Not that he doesn't want to be, but it's a survival sometimes. And putting food on the table, making sure that your kids have clothes, that they're able to come to school, that they have health care, And that's a struggle and, 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 and it's, it's constantly a struggle. And so we as educators need to recognize that. And there are some educators that really don't know because they don't have that background. They haven't come from poverty. They uh, haven't been, they haven't had to learn English. Uh, and so they, you know, they come in and maybe they don't understand that. And it's not their fault, that's just their background. And so we as the, uh, leaders in the school, we need to teach that. We need to model that. We need to have our high expectations because every student, my belief is, is can learn. Every student that you walk into, they can learn, but you have to have that partnership with parents, with families, and we as educators need to be flexible in what they do, but we uh, need to find a way to uh, support kids and, and see success. So. Again, for me, uh, I focus on what I think is best for kids, and I really focus a lot on student success and how uh, we can uh, reward the positive things that are going on in the student's life. First part, definitely yes. You know, um, what we think about education or continuing our education comes from home. It mm -hmm. comes from what kids learn here at school, um, and I think you know, the more we can show kids what's out there for them, the the more we can change the perception of, you know, there are still people there that like, you're a girl, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. You you shouldn't want to go into that profession if, you know, um, that's not what our family does. We, we go to school, you know, they're kind of not uh, accepting of the trades, even mm -hmm. though, I mean, if we didn't have people that were in the trades, well, we wouldn't have a desk, we wouldn't have a car, right. we wouldn't have plumbing, <laughs> we wouldn't have electricity. So, you know, every path is important and it's just important for us to make sure that we let the kids know that whatever path you choose, there's options out there for you. We can help you find those options. Um, our counseling department, they're so fantastic at 
finding resources, whether it's, you know, educational or financial to help the kids um, and just, you know, showing them all the programs that we have here mm -hmm. that could help them on their path to success, whatever that may be. Right. Um, parent communication and engagement is essential. It's one of our, you know, um, one of our goals. And the nice part about Nogales is that the community really believes in education. Mm -hmm. That's why we have one of the highest graduation rates in the state of Arizona. And parents do, um, we understand that they do work, you know, two to three jobs. So they may not be home um, with their student. And so we do our best to support them and help them. But I do feel that education is, is a huge area of importance to them. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes they don't know exactly how to help their students, but that's why the schools need to open their doors and to welcome them and, you know, offer that support and guidance because we have their child in our schools eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. So that we see, you know, we as teachers and administrators see the kids a lot more. Right. So we can change that mindset. Um, and, you know, if, when we have students who we know that are struggling, always offering that, that support, that family support, because it's, it takes all of us, not just what we do at school, but we have to work as collaboratively as possible. I mean, that's something that unfortunately we can't prevent. Mm -hmm. It happens and we see it in, in schools, especially when, when we have to provide interventions for our students and when our counselors, um, my assistant Ms. Dan or myself, we speak in regarding the academic performance of a student that or when we try to get a hold of the parents something that tells us a lot and we probably understand why sometimes the student is struggling because other obviously it can be that at home there's other priorities mm -hmm. and priorities that unfortunately they're very they can vary drastically from to be able to where they can escape at night to the point where uh i mean the priority is to be able to survive in the summers to sure. to get their education. So what do we do is we constantly be, um, are involved in our counselors, are involved in different agencies to be able to provide assistance to, to our students, to our families, and everything that we keep in motivating them, uh, pushing them to not drop out of school, mm -hmm. to continue their education, to see the benefits of the education and where they can get them and also how is that going to help them probably through the rest of their lives mm -hmm. and how can they also be supporting to their families as well. Mm -hmm. So we try to involve as many programs after school programs from like I said different agencies so that they can receive that guidance, that support that they might sometimes need and understand the importance of education for for the family for the kids. I have a closing question for you. With major issues like the ones we've discussed today being present in schools, do you believe that there should be a greater sense of urgency not only pertaining to our area or our state, but across the country? And who do you believe should take on that responsibility? Should it be districts, states, the government and its various departments or a mixture of all of them? An answer to that is yes, it's, it should be a mixture of all of, all of them. Uh, what um, concerns me is we have people at the, the legislative level making decisions about kids and educators that have no idea how to run a school. Uh, they, most of them have gone to school, but they have no clue how to run a school, how to fund a school, what's important and what's not important, yet they're making decisions. And I rarely uh, interact with those legislators and, and they don't ask enough questions. They need to come into the schools and follow teachers around. I invite any legislator to come down to Nogales and follow me around the school and try to figure out what I do all day and what my role is as an assistant principal. I welcome that and they need to get an idea of how our teachers work and the positives not only within the school but the areas for growth. And yes, we, there's a lot of growth that needs to take place Yet, um, it just seems like we're not communicating and that communication needs to be there. So uh, my answer to that question is um, we need to work together to make it better for all kids. I, I definitely think that urgency is needed everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think here in, in our area, we're very fortunate 
um, that we have great kids, you know, even if they are coming from poverty, we have support from parents. We have, we have it so much better than other places in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, and as you mentioned, I think absolutely it has to be a group effort. You know, it can't be just the states. It can't be just property tax. It, it has to be everything. Sure. Everybody has to value it and understand how important it is for our future, for the country's future. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a it's a definitely a group effort. I feel it would be a great collaborative effort, right? In the perfect world, that's what we would hope for. Mm -hmm. um, when that's not going on, then the district leaders and the governing boards have to work collaboratively to make sure that we're giving our students and our teachers and all of our families the best possible education that we can offer. Now, but And obviously the perfect world, we would want mm -hmm. everybody to come together sure. for the sole purpose of our students and our families. Um, but that the responsibility falls on the district leadership, mm -hmm. the district as a whole, and the governing boards. That In my opinion, I think that it should be a uh, whole group collaboration because, again, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We understand what's the need for our, for our community, for our students, for our education, for our public ed. Um, and I think that's, that's significantly important to be able to move in the right direction, to be able to ensure like um, funding and distributed equally and it's, it's consistent among the entire nation. Yes, we understand that there are some other states greater than others in the sense that there's no population. That's something understandable. But I mean, regardless, it's right now, we all be benefiting nationwide as a country that, that we more we prepare our students, the more educated we have our, our, our community, the better we'll be as a country as well. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add or anything you're observing right now that you just want to speak on and get out there? Well, one of my jobs is to make sure that what we call students in need mm -hmm. And I don't go by ethnicity, but for here, it is Hispanic mm -hmm. and students with disabilities and students whose English, they never even heard English till they started the first day of school. To address their needs, you have to do what's called close the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. They're just as bright, they're just as worthy as any student. Yeah. But... Um, and I'll use myself as an example. Mm -hmm. I have three grandsons, a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. The three-year-old has been, because the mother works sure. in child care since he's been one, he can say the months of the year, he can count, he knows his colors, mm -hmm. he knows his animals. He can't quite write his name yet because he doesn't have the hand-eye mm -hmm. coordination, but he knows his name. Now he goes into kindergarten with a child who's never had a book read to them, who's never visited the zoo, who is lucky to get fed enough, let alone any extras. Is it fair to say that that child that's been deprived isn't worthy of a good education? No. What we have to do is supplement, mm -hmm. but you can only supplement to a certain degree. Sure. Maybe that child has an after school program where it's more social, emotional support. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there is, the only way to really address this is to face reality. Yeah. Yeah. If that child comes from a home where there's abuse, where there's neglect, where uh, there's disruption, where there's no stability, <laughs> Just giving them an extra hour of kindergarten isn't going to solve the problem. So I want to support what I said before. If we really want equity in education, money matters, but more so just the social emotional state of that child and the factors that go into making a stable home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That you don't have to have a home where the child goes to Disneyland every day. Yeah. I mean, that's nice, and that's a learning experience. I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a home where the child has a certain bedtime and consistently is fed well and isn't involved in listening to violence and disruption. Yeah. 
because we've had many successful students when I was teaching at McAllis High School that came from very low economic circumstances. And they were valedictorians and salutatorians and in IB classes. It's not only the money they make. We've had very rich kids who didn't succeed because there was no stability in the home, mm -hmm. despite the fact that the parents had a lot of income. So that's where some of the focus and the money needs to be. Thank you to everybody watching this. This is a part of my senior project, and I wanted to showcase in a unique way the different issues that are currently present in public education today. I want to thank everybody that I interviewed, all the professionals who work for the, Uni the Nogales Unified School District, my mentor, and who's also my dad. He played a huge role in informing me about these topics and uh, encouraging me to delve deeper into them. And once again, I'd like to thank all of you for checking out this video and supporting it. And I'd love to hear your opinions on the topics that were discussed in this video. Thank you.